special Sunday. Easter's a special Sunday, isn't it? And today is a very special Sunday. Because today uh, is Whit Sunday. White Sunday. Been abbreviated. Or Pentecost Sunday. And the reason it's special is because on this day, we followers of Jesus, we Christians, we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we read about in the second chapter of the book of Acts. This is where the modern day church and all its manifestations, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, it traces its lineage all the way back to that event 2,023 years ago. Isn't that amazing? And all these years later, that same Pentecostal experience can be experienced by you and I. Because the Holy Spirit was sent from the Father God, sent down to this earth to touch and fill and overflow in those 120 people in that upper room, yeah? And they sp- as you'll see, they spilled out of that upper room at 9 o'clock in the morning. Some people thought they were drunk. They were so happy. They all came out speaking in other languages that they never learned. <laughs> but their experience was very, very special in that upper room. So before I get into the main body of this, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a, how shall I put it, a lead up to it, a little bit of a backstory to that amazing event called Pentecost. If we look in the Gospel of Luke, Chapter 24, verses 44 to 52. I've, I've chosen some uh, really nice paintings that have been done over the years to illustrate this message. So let's have a look at this. This is Jesus after his resurrection. How many know there was, there was several weeks between when Jesus rose from the dead to when the Holy Spirit was poured out? And during that time, he appeared to them at various times and seasons to explain the things of the kingdom of God. So this is post-resurrection. This is Luke, the good doctor, recording what happened. He's a historian. Then it says, so let's read 44 of chapter 24. Then he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. So before he died. Everything which has been written about me in the law of Moses and in the writings of the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. There was so much about Christ written in the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds to help them understand the scriptures. And he said, and so it's written that Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance necessary for forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Now, let's look at these couple of scriptures. And you are witnesses of these things. 49, he says, listen carefully. And how many know he'd already said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But here he's saying, listen carefully. I am sending the promise of my father, the Holy Spirit, upon you. He talked about that in John 14, John 16. But you are to remain in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed or fully equipped with power from on high. So he'd said, you're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But he's saying, guys, you can't do it in your own strength. Wait until God fulfills his promise and pours out the Holy Spirit upon you. Yeah? All right? So he led them out as far as Bethany. Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. The same author, Luke, the historian, who compiled that gospel, he also compiled another book, which we call the Book of Acts. To, and written to the same person, a person called Theophilus. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through to 8. So the same author about the same thing, the Holy Spirit. He says here in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In my first book I told you, and what we've just read is part of that first book. In my first book I told you, Theophilus, 
about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them that in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Verse 4. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John, John the Baptist, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, we've just celebrated with 15 people their baptism in water, yeah? And bat, the word baptism, baptizio in the Greek, it means to fully immerse, yeah? So when you think about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you are talking about an experience where you are totally immersed in the power and presence of God, the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So it goes on here and it says, verse 7, he replied, Oh, sorry, somebody asked a question. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has a time come for you to free Israel from the Romans and restore our kingdom? They're just thinking natural. They still didn't get it that God's kingdom is not about soldiers. It's not about insurrections. It's not about political control. It's about a spiritual kingdom where Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And we are his subjects. You hear what I'm saying? So he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But look at verse 8. What's the whole purpose of this experience? The whole purpose of Pentecost, the, the reason why he said, wait in Jerusalem, don't go just yet. I've told you to go, but you need something, guys. And he says, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Witnessing to what? Well, they saw what happened directly, yeah? We witness to what we believe is recorded in the Scriptures. We witness to our own experience of meeting Jesus. Of life before. Life at that moment when you meet Him. And life afterwards. You've heard... Cherie this morning already give her before moment in the middle and the afterwards. We have all got a story to tell. We've all got a narrative. But for us to actually tell that narrative in a way that impacts the people around about us, in the office, in the street, your family, your friends, we have got to receive that power. Amen. Because if we don't, we probably won't say much at all. We will probably won't be very bold at all. Think about the difference between Peter before this experience and Peter afterwards. Peter denied Jesus three times. And when you look at the strength of the words in the Greek language, man, he really denied Jesus. I mean, it was like, I, I won't go into it, but if you understand what he really said, uh, it was very forceful, his denial of Jesus. But look at what happened afterwards. Who's the one that steps up to the plate to explain to 3,000 people standing before him that came to hear what was going on in this Pentecostal experience? Who stands up there and preaches a sermon and 3,000 get saved? Peter! <laughs> so he goes, he goes from being afraid. He goes from being cowering and cowed. And he goes there to confidence and boldness, friends. And that's what, that's what the church needs today is so much of an infilling of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis that we are emboldened so that we, when God opens the door in a conversation, somebody asks a question, that we can go straight through that door and being confident of what we believe. But more than just explaining, we need that power that our words make an impact. You know, when I'm sharing with someone my faith, I, you know, I don't want my words just being like a bit of dribble that comes out of my mouth. I don't want it to be like some philosophical you know, approach that massages their intellect. I want my words so touched by God that when I tell them about God's Son dying on a cross for them because He loves them so much, and He doesn't want to judge them, He wants to save them. And He did it for them. I, I want that to stir up something in the inside. You know, even if they're agnostic and atheistic or, or, or adherents to another religion, that there'll be enough power in what we say that they might even think 
again. They might have second thoughts. Do you hear what I'm saying? So he says here in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and Waitrose, and Tesco's, and Sainsbury's, and to the ends of the earth, to the bloke sitting on the flight next to me on the flight out of Poland. I haven't got time to go into that one. But God wants to open up conversations because he cares about everyone. Christ died for everyone's sins. Every single thing that anybody's ever done wrong, he bore that sin, was judged for it. So that when we believe in him and and, and at the end of the day, when we all come up for judgment, because how many you know there's a judgment day? Even the world understands that. There are movies called Judgment Day. It's just built into us, isn't it? Because of our guilty conscience that kind of just in some kind of nebulous way, we kind of think, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. And we kind of understand that one day we are all going to be, I have to give an account for our lives. I knew that before I asked Christ into my life. I'd done so many terrible things. My conscience was killing me. But that was the influence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world. And my goodness, I was the world. <laughs> I was, I was in the world and I was worldly. He says the Holy Spirit will convict them of sin. What it is. And, and that they're guilty of breaking those commandments of God. And their conscience will be heightened. Their conscience will register. That he will come and convict them of sin. But he'll also convict them of righteousness. That there's a righteousness to be had. And it's the righteousness of Christ. That, that when we meet him and we believe in him... That he takes our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness. That's a good deal. As a matter of fact, when it speaks about imputed righteousness in the book of Romans, it's using a word that is an accounting word. We had a debit in our account because of unrighteousness and sin. But Jesus never sinned once. So he, in his account, it was perfect. So when God imputes Christ's righteousness to us, it's like he takes Christ's righteousness and credits our account. Isn't that marvelous? That's one of the great truths of the book of Romans. This this wonderful sense of God balancing the ledger because of what Jesus did. Isn't it marvelous? So you receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, let's look at the event itself. Let's look at this event, all right? So I think what I'm going to do, Luke, just because this is a fairly long passage, um, I'll, I will stop around about 16, verse 16. I wrote a lot more than that, but uh, we're a bit behind. All right, so this is the day of Pentecost. This is what happened. Are you ready, everybody? On the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> all the believers, now there was 120 of them. Now let me make a point here. If it was only the apostles who were supposed to be doing all this, only, only 11, Judas already having committed suicide, 11 remaining. If, if, if some, you know, some people say, oh, well, it was the apostles supposed to do it all. But you see, all 120 received the power. Which tells me that the responsibility of witnessing for Jesus belongs to all of us, not just the apostles in that early day. Are you with me? Or else God would have just touched them and everybody, everybody would have gone, oh, wow, that's good, Peter. Look at that, John. Oh, you've got the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, you crack on, guys. But you see, we all need to crack on. So let's go. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, like a cat five tornado. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire, you you would see these in these paintings, appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present, everybody say everyone. (laughs) Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. There's these doctrines around today. Oh, well, it's not for everybody. It's not everybody. That is in complete That is at complete odds with Scripture. Wherever you see people together in a place to receive the Holy Spirit, they all received it. There's not a single recorded instance where a group of people 
somebody got it and somebody didn't. Usually what's going on is there's blockages in people's minds, a bit of unbelief, a bit of wrong doctrine. A lot of the time it's like, oh man, you know, anyway. But let's crack on. And it says that everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and they began speaking in other languages. Plural. As the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. How many of you speak in tongues in this place? Do you know you're not alone? Do you know how many Pentecostals there are in the world today? How many people speak in tongues today? I did the research. And then I went to the AOG conference, which is a conference for Pentecostal churches. And they'd done the research as well. I'll leave it up here. Do you know there are 700 million people in this world today who have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues? 700 million. I'm just going to jump ahead here. And you know, they, they are represented in the three main branches of Christianity. Protestants, Catholics. Do you know that under... I'm not a papist, okay? I'm not a papist, I'm a Protestant. But... Under the papacy of John Paul II, there were 120 million Catholics received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Wow. In fact, he said this, Pope John Paul II. He said, the Catholic charismatic renewal, which in the 50 years of its existence has touched the lives of over 120 million Catholics in more than 200 countries. It says, back in 2004, Pope John Paul II said, thanks to the charismatic movement, a multitude of Christians, men and women, young people and adults, have rediscovered Pentecost and as a living reality in their lives. Wow! Isn't that amazing? From the Orthodox, from the Catholics, from the Protestants. 700 million! The, the, the Earth's population has just clicked over to 8 billion. So you're talking about between 8.5 and 9% of the planet has a shared experience with us, thanks to the grace of God. Isn't that amazing? Now, that, that begs the question, though, doesn't it? If these early Christians went on in their generation... And it's, it says this in, the, in the, book of, the, book of, the book of Acts. It says that they turned the world upside down. <laughs> they turned the world upside down. You know, all the, 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 the synagogue leaders and the civic leaders, they got upset when Paul and Barnabas and Silas arrived in the town. They says, oh no, these men who've turned the world upside down have come here. <laughs> And in 300 years, they turned the Roman Empire upside down to where Christianity became the state religion. That's a long way from Nero burning Christians on the stake to light up his parties. How did they do it? Friend, they did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. They did it because they received this incredible experience. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, I thank God, you Corinthians. He says, I thank God I speak more in tongues than all of you put together. Wow! Even the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I know he's gone for a bit of a wonder doctrinally, very seriously, need to pray for him. But when he was doing a lot better, he made this statement. He said, he told the BBC, he says, I pray in tongues every day. So friend, this experience is for every single believer. So let's go on and let's have a look at this experience as it unfolds. Are you, are you with me? So down to verse 5. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. So from every nation. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by believers. Bewildered. How, how, can, how can I hear you speak in my language? I'm amazed, you know. I, I spent the last five days trying to resurrect my schoolboy French on Duolingo. 
Before that, I was trying to resurrect my schoolboy Spanish, because Julie and I had taken our David out to Barcelona for a few days in June. It's a hard slog trying to dig up your French from what, 40, 40 years ago? Oh, more than that. 50 years ago. But it's amazing how much you, you can actually take on board as a, as a school kid. But friend, when I get to France, I'm probably going to have a few workable phrases <laughs> and be able to say, je m'appelle Robert. <laughs> And I've been trying to get into the Spanish since 1993 when the Lord told me to learn the Russian language. That's a slog, the Russian language. And I can have a conversation with their bros over there in the corner. I can hold a conversation, but if they get technical or get into their humor, I I lose them pretty quick. But you know, in the Holy Spirit, I speak several languages that my head has no clue about. I never learned them, just like these guys, and they spring up from here. How many of you have received the gift of the baptism of the Spirit and speaking in tongues? Probably about half of you. And just for the other half of you, because the Bible tells us in several places that the gift of speaking in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever, okay? Or, or those on the point of believing, those ones that you've told something about Jesus about and you've explained a bit of the Bible, and I have several languages. Would you like to hear one? Yeah. You would like to hear one? Yeah. All right. I don't know what's going to happen. Here it is. Porostagai, terista men kente te he. Korosta babal kenenete te sim. Sendi karbai teristente kohombar ka. Rostende remiste ke henditi. Rostende estel pinkam brastamanano. Perdite ke hemde ristike. Las tordo cristente kir mardo goboroste chilnaido cristende kiri. Vrinamo ketel kistandre kistanamai, rosteti kiu mai kren tinto. Shabar tengribino, el tibi rastendrimino, erdidi vragi. I've never learned that language in my life. Neither have you, all you that speak in tongues, that have had this Pentecostal experience. I've got some that sound oriental. I've got one that sounds like an African language where, you know, there's an African language where they kind of click a lot. Yeah, I've had that one from time to time. Sometimes I just sit there praying in the Spirit and I just go, wow, Holy Spirit, that is amazing. It is an incredible experience. It it really is an amazing experience. And I, I, like the Archbishop, I do that every day for quite some time because I know I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope I haven't embarrassed anybody. I hope I haven't embarrassed anybody. But so many Christians, they kind of, you know, they, they kind of keep it so private. But the Bible tells us these signs shall follow those who believe. They shall speak in other languages. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so many Pentecostal Christians... They are guilty of doing what the Bulgarians did to me at the fall of communism. In the early 90s, I went out to Bulgaria for the first time. Julie and I had to drive by ourselves. And do you know what they'd done? They'd removed all the road signs. From one end of the country, I never knew where I was. And one occasion, I got off the motorway to go into a town to find an old bloke that spoke Russian (laughs) to tell me I was in the right path. Everywhere I went, they took the signs down so I couldn't find my way. Friend, I know the gospel message points to Jesus, but he gave us other ancillary signs. Amen. And I've lost count of the number of times where I've done life with someone as a Christian and I've opened the Bible up a few times and and I've said, listen, man, you know, look at that verse there. Those that believe, those that, (coughs) pardon me, those that believe these signs will follow them. Those who speak in other tongues. When I first received this gift, I was working with seven Vietnamese guys who were avowed Buddhists. And Tony and I, the young apprentice, he might even be watching this. Hello, Tony in Australia. We had we had we had shared our faith with them time and time and time again. 
And they would all say, no, Buddha is God. Buddha is God. Buddha is God. And we go, Jesus is God. Jesus. And just back and forth. And, nobody... and then one evening I was praying and God gave me a language that sounded just like that. And to cut a long story short, I went in the next day and I demonstrated it to them. And I said, well, is it your language? And I said, how you do that? <laughs> We've been trying to teach you how to speak Vietnamese for four years now. How did you do that? I said, is it your language? He says, no, but it's very, very close. His eyeballs nearly popped. His jaw hit the floor. And I says, well, listen, man, here is in the Bible. And he just looked at me. And he said, I, 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 I don't get it. <laughs> but you see, it was a sign. And once we began to see them getting healed, because they were a sick bunch, once they started to experience the healing, and man, they had some spiritual problems as well, and they would call us down to Springvale. Remember, Springvale, it was called the Little Saigon. And they would bring us down there because they had some people who were really, really spiritually oppressed. You know what I mean? I remember one bloke said to me, he says, he said, you, this is one of the guys I was working with. He says, you believe in spirit? I says, what kind of spirit? I was thinking, Holy Spirit? He says, no, bad spirit. I says, well, yeah, I, I know there can be. He says, can you get them out? In other words, can you cast them out? I says, I was very young in the Lord then. I go, yeah. <laughs> and my brother and I went down there and uh, set this person free in the name of Jesus. So I happened to be a 15-year-old girl. They were so scared of her. She was so angry. I mean, man, you get the spirit power in somebody, man. It's like, whoa. Amen. So let's crack on. Oh, my goodness. We're out of time. But... Um, have we covered most of that? Yeah, okay. So let's go through to, I've covered the fact that the, the promise of the baptisms for every generation. Acts 2.28, sorry, Acts 2.38 to 39. Some of you need to hear this because you, you've inherited just wrong teaching somewhere along the line. And it says here, let's cut it to 39 just for the sake of time. Acts 2 verse 39. Peter still on his preach here. And he says, for the promise of the Holy Spirit is to you and for you and your children and to and for all that are far away. So it's not, you watch this, it's not just geographic. Even to and for as many as the Lord our God invites and bids to come, which includes us. So this promise that they received is for all of God's children in every generation, every place geographically. That's what the Word of God said. Are you with me? The purpose, we've looked at the purpose, the purpose of Pentecost, you shall receive power. Greek word, dunamis. Do you know from the same root word, we get the English words dynamo, dynamite, dynamic. So what kind of power do we have to tell people about Jesus? To step out and surprise them with a bit of the supernatural? What kind of power have we got? Is it a, is it a little bit of... It says, it's from the same root word as dynamite. Wow, dynamo. Friends, we need to believe in this. Because if that early church turned the world upside down in that first generation, why is it that we've got 700 million people that have had the same experience and the world ain't turned upside down? It begs a question, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It really begs a question. The church of Jesus Christ today needs a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit, a wholesale baptism in the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So 